Good evening, everybody. Let's try that again. Good evening, everybody. I'm Bill Davis. I'm the president of Southern California Public Radio, and I want to thank you all for. Oh. I want to thank you all for being here tonight. I want to thank you all for putting up with me saying, please call 862-9862 and uh, all of those uh, telephone numbers that we do all the time. Um, but it, it's really a thrill to be here tonight to uh, have this conversation. And really, this is a, a conversation that we've been having at KPCC for as long as I've been here, which is 14 years. And I was at National Public Radio before I came to uh, uh, Southern California Public Radio. Um, and the, the work that Larry Mantle and Pat Morrison and uh, Frank Stoltz down here uh, and so many others have done around uh, the issues of community policing and what kind of uh, society we want to have in Southern California, it's an ongoing conversation. So it's uh, wonderful to have that in person and up close as well as over the phone on your uh, mobile phone, over the air and on your mobile phones, et cetera. But in person and up close, I think is uh, you know, preferable to just about anything else. Now, um, Ronald Reagan, our 40th president, once had a, a, a saying that I very much believe in. Uh, and that is, uh, he said that if, Cal if, if the pilgrims had come to California, Plymouth Rock would still be undiscovered. Um, and so, uh, when I came out to uh, California from uh, National Public Radio, I thought that made a lot of sense. While I was at NPR, uh, excuse me, when I was at SEPR, um, our board chair, Jarl Mohn, uh, decided that he thought it would be nice to go the other direction and uh, go and run National Public Radio, having drunk deeply from what we've been doing here at Southern California Public Radio. And he will be joining us here in just a second, but I do want to have one other shout out. And that is uh, that as soon as Jarl got to DC, he started to say, hmm, there's some really good people at, NP at uh, KPCC. We ought to see if we can get them to join. And Adrian Florido, who I think is here. Adrian, raise your hand. Yeah, right here. Uh, has just joined National Public Radio as one of their reporters. Um, uh, and so Adrian, we will miss you here but we wish you nothing but the best of luck in your new gig at NPR. So uh, would you please join me in welcoming Jarl Mohn, the president of National Public Radio. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Bill. I, I, I like to tell people that 98% uh, of what I learned about public radio, I learned from Bill Davis and uh, the team at KPCC in Southern California Public Radio. And uh, Bill also was on the... <laughs> this is going to be my Facebook post. This is, this is what it's, it's, my life has come to. I'm having my friends help me with social media. But uh, <laughs> it's pretty funny. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. <laughs> but we had a great, we had a great time uh, at KPCC. And uh, as I said, not, about 98% of what I learned about public radio, I, I learned from KPCC. Bill also happened to be on the search committee while they were looking for the CEO of NPR, so he had to recuse himself from that search. But we have in the audience, where's Howard Wolner? Is Howard here? There he is, right back there. Howard is on the NPR Foundation Board and the NPR uh, Inc. Board, and he was on the search committee. So we're thankful. Thank you for my job. I really appreciate it. And is Miriam here? Miriam Mescarolis, also from the NPR Foundation Board. Great to have you here. From the KPCC, uh, Southern California Public Radio Board. Uh, my successor as board chair, Jihee Ha. Is Jihee here? Where's Jihee? Right here. Great. Thank you, Jihee. And we also want to give a, a shout out and a thanks to the Kresge Foundation, who have been great supporters of this uh, NPR Presents program. Michelle Martin, who we're going to bring out in a second, uh, has started the program in New York City, uh, went on to Charlotte, North Carolina. We did Dallas, Texas, Miami, New Orleans, Detroit and ending here in Los Angeles. So we're deeply appreciative of the Kresge Foundation. And so I want to introduce Michelle Martin to get the evening going. Uh, I'm really honored to have Michelle uh, be a colleague now. She's a great journalist. She is a fabulous communicator. And she's one of those people that can really, on a story in an interview, peel the onion. And I think you're going to see that tonight. So please give a warm welcome to NPR's Michelle Martin.
Well, thank you. Thank you for coming. And uh, thank you all so much for being here. We hope it's going to be a great conversation. Uh, I'm Michelle Martin of NPR News. And along with KPCC here in Los Angeles, we welcome you to the LA Theater Center. We're here tonight to talk about something that is on a lot of our minds, probably all of our minds here. And that is our relationship with law enforcement, with the police. What do you think about when you think about the police? Maybe you think about the guy, the nice guy who directs traffic at your kid's local school. Or maybe you think about the guy who got your bike back after a big kid took it from you. Or maybe you think about being pulled over time and time again for no reason that makes sense to you. Maybe you think about the guy who gave you a lift home after a traffic accident or who stood between you and some other chaos. Or maybe you think about Michael Brown, or Ezel Ford, or Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, and for some of the people in this theater, the one name that sums it all up, Rodney King. Do you see yourself in any of these statements? Do you see truth in any of them? If so, you are not alone. Because for many people, the relationship between police and the communities they serve seems more complicated, perhaps more bruised, and for some people, more broken than ever. And yet to other people, credible law enforcement seems more crucial than ever. So what do we do? Where do we go with all of this, with this complicated relationship? To us, it seems that there is no progress without understanding, and there is no understanding without sharing our stories. So tonight, we have stories. We have a panel of LA residents, police, poets, performers, who all have their own stories. And we are very excited to hear them, and we are very excited that you are here to hear them with us. And we are going to start with a name and a face that many of you know, and if you don't, you surely will. He is an actor on the rise, Richard Cabral, who you might know from the provocative ABC television drama, American Crime. He's going to perform an excerpt from his one-man show, Fighting Shadows. For our live stream audience, and frankly, for some of you here, I want you to know that this language is for adults. And by that, I mean that some may find it offensive, but we hope that you will hear what Richard has to say in the spirit in which he offers it to you. And with that being said, Richard Cabral. My life of crime soon begins. Me and the guys are tagging and stealing candy bars, things of that sort. I figure if we steal, we might as well make it worthwhile. Bikes are a hot, hot commodity, and I don't have one, so why not get one? I'm walking down Whittier Boulevard. I see two guys on bikes. I cross the street. This will be a test of my new power. I lock in on one of the guys. Get off your bike. I see the fear in his eyes. He knows I'm gang affiliated. He lowers his head. Get off your bike. And he does. Just like that. I ride off like the wind, straight home to the south side of Montebello with my first big steal. I take the bike to my room, and I stare at it with immense pride. I feel commanding, unstoppable. Moments later, I hear a knock on the front door. I run down and open it. Standing there is the Montebello police. Can we ask you some questions? I say, yeah, let me get a t-shirt. I run to my room knowing they're here for the bike. I grab the bike and I throw it out the second story window. <laughs> I walk back down. They ask me about the bike. I say, I don't know what you're talking about. The officer says, the kid just wants his bike back. Nothing's going to happen to you. I believe him, and I tell him where it is. When they come back with the bike, they cuff me. 13 years old and headed to East Lake Juvenile Hall, 
where all my uncles have set foot before me. I will be all right, I tell myself. If everyone else could do it, I could do it. Fuck it. Walking into jail for the first time is nerve-wracking. This is it, the place where boys become men real quick. My first introduction to this world is a piece of jail time I'll always remember. A heavy-set officer reads my file. So you like to rob people. They say, no, sir. This gets him angry. He looks me dead in the eyes. While it says here, you like to rob people. My homies have taught me both officers and inmates prey on weakness. I'm terrified inside, but I don't back down. Well, maybe that file was wrong. He continues to stare, trying to put the fear of God in me. I don't flinch. He suddenly grins. <laughs> Welcome to my world, son. Because with that attitude, you'll be in and out of here for the rest of your life. I got all the time in the world to fuck you up. Mm -hmm. Richard Cabral, thank you. Thank you. If you turn your seat. And now I'd like to bring out the rest of our panel, and I know you're going to enjoy hearing what they have to say. And while they're being seated, yes. <laughs> While they're being seated, we'd like to mention that um, our conversation, we hope, will go beyond this theater. Many people are joining us via live stream, and we are happy to have you. And many people are also joining us on Twitter at the hashtag Streets and Beats. And we hope you'll also join us there as well. If you are in the theater, you might find it a little bit slow because there are so many of us here, and we're happy about that. Uh, so please be patient, and uh, please enjoy the conversation. And are we ready to go? Let me introduce the rest of our panel. Luis Rodriguez is the current Poet Laureate of Los Angeles, an award-winning author. He's also the founding editor of Tia Chucha Press. It's a cross-cultural press for socially engaged poetry and literature. Yasmin Muktasid is the founder and president of Black Women Matters. It's an organization dedicated to promoting the positive portrayal of black women in the media. Rafer Owens wears several hats in the course of his week. He is an LA County Sheriff's Deputy. He's based in Compton. He's also the pastor of Faith Inspirational Missionary Baptist Church. And uh, Sheriff, we're happy to have you with us as well. Thank you. Captain Ruby Malachi is a 20-year veteran of the LAPD. She has had a wide-ranging career, ranging from patrol, gangs, and bike patrol to chief, chief's aid. She is now the commanding officer of a newly created community relationship division where she's focusing on social media. Captain, we're very pleased to have you with us as well. Thank you for having me. And see, everybody has a buddy here, and Sam, you are my buddy, my anchor buddy. You're a journalist and author. He's been covering the illegal drug scene, uh, gangs, and community policing for decades. Also had a, a decade reporting from Mexico, yes, right. as I exactly. understand it. Well, and he's here tonight to help put some of these stories in context, given your long history in covering these stories, kind of from the, the birds from the, what is it, the grass tops and the grassroots. And so we're really glad to have you here with us as well. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you. So, so let me start at the beginning, because Richard was, was good enough to start us off kind of at the beginning for him. And Luis, I wanted to ask you, you know, you, you also, you know, Richard has mentioned that he started out in gang life. And Luis, you've written very beautifully and eloquently and honestly in two of your memoirs and in also your poetry about your story and your connection to the world. Um, you describe some pretty miserable treatment in, at the hands of law enforcement. And I wondered if you would just tell us one of your stories, if you would, and how your, that shaped your idea of what law enforcement was supposed to be or what it was. 
Well, to me, this is 40 some years ago, but there was no Miranda uh, rulings. There wasn't too much protections. To me, the police were an occupying force in my neighborhood, which was South San Gabriel, uh, considered the poorest neighborhood in LA County at the time. And uh, I felt that we were at war with the police. Uh, they killed four of my friends unarmed. They beat me up, others. We have just long stories about this. Um, I wrote this in my book. Some people told me that I lied in the book, but all of it has been proven out with the rest of sheriff's deputies and other people involved in this. Uh, but I do feel very strongly because one of the things that I got out of all that is I learned to be a poet. I learned to be a thinker, an organizer. I learned to be active. I learned to fight for social justice. I do feel that in many ways today, uh, we have to have a real county, um, community accountability that takes uh, president, that the police are needed and we need them in our communities, but we need them to be part of a community driven package uh, that we can say we're accountable to each other. I do think this is the time now to begin to open up to the fact that all of us are dealing with the same thing. No more criminalization of our youth, no more criminalization of people just for being brown or black uh, or poor, that we begin to look at our communities as uh, human beings that all deserve the best that this country and this world should give. Mm -hmm. But I, I want to ask you, Luis, do you see the police now as people who are here to protect you or not? Well, I don't see them so much as that, but I will say this. I was a cop reporter in San Bernardino in the early 80s. I learned a lot. I befriended many police officers, and I don't mind saying that, because I began to realize their end of the story. When you're a cop recorder, recorder in those days, you got to go out with the police. You got to see the dead bodies. They don't do this so much now, but in those days, we got to be with them. Uh, I had one detective who became a really good friend, and I began to realize that they're under the gun. They're under the gun by a society that says crime is their problem, and I don't think that's true. I think crime is a social, political, and justice issue. I think that we need to do a lot more on the front end and not so much on the back end, which is when the police come in. So I do feel that police are being given the short stick when it comes to that. I think that they should not be the answer to everything that we can't resolve, that, that we need to be there as community so they do the things they can't do. Okay. Richard, you're a number of years younger than Luis, but you actually described a very similar story. And I wanted to ask, I mean, your involvement with Gang life began also at a really young age. You were like 11 um, or something? Yeah, my, my family had been involved in gangs from, um, since the 1970s. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I just kind of grew up in it. And probably like 11, 12 years old, that's when the turning point came. And um, I, I just accepted it. Well, in the community, in a poor um, East Los Angeles community, you don't know anything different. All my friends were gang members. The majority were. Uh, and my uncles, my dad wasn't around, so my uncles were the ones that kind of raised me and those were my inspiration and I just kind of fell in the system. You know, a lot of you know, little kids, a lot of little kids when they think about what they want to be, they think about being a cop. That was never part of your world, was it? No, definitely not. That was not even part of the... Yeah. <laughs> um, it it, it would have been great, but I mean, the, the cops in, in, in our community, they, they didn't reach out to us. I'm not saying it was their fault, but like maybe if, 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 if a cop or... Um, what, what it took the time to, to like, everybody knew that our, my, my home was messed up. I come from a broken home. We all come from broken homes. And, and maybe if someone would have just paid attention to that, maybe not even a cop, maybe a, a counselor at school or just everything was just so screwed up back then. And um, so there, I feel that there was kind of no hope for me and for me and my friends. Was that your earliest memory of the police, the story that you just told us here? Was that your earliest, or is there anything earlier than that that the, you can my, remember? My, my mom, she worked for um, Montebello Police Department <laughs> until I was like five years old. So my first memories is going, she, used to, she was a secretary for the detectives. So it was just kind of funny how things played out. Like, um, she, she stopped working there when I was five, and like six years later, like some of the detectives that I knew were now coming to my house to take me to jail. So my first memories were that, but, um, but I feel that the reason why I grew up in gangs was because of my, my broken home. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, Captain, you have a really interesting story about uh, your first encounter with the police, your first real encounter with the police, and I was hoping you would, would not mind telling it. 
Uh, no, I don't mind at all. It's it's been many years ago. It, it's personal, but um, I don't mind sharing it because. Uh, let's see, I was probably 19 years old, so it was in 1992 or so that um, I had been in, in college and visiting some friends and had not even had a drink in my system, nothing, so I'm driving, and um, I, it was a day that it had just rained, so it was the first, first rain, and so the streets were really wet, so I'm getting on the freeway, and I was going fast, and so I <clears throat> overturned on the freeway, and my car was, was flipped over on its side, on the passenger side, and I was suspended by my seatbelt in the driver's side, if you can envision that. So I'm stuck, you know, with my seatbelt. And so I was on the side of the freeway, I'm flashing my, my brights and trying to get someone's attention and honking the horn, but it was two o'clock in the morning. So shortly thereafter, I hear a, a voice, a male voice, and he says, uh, are you okay? And I said, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, I just need help getting out because I'm stuck in my seatbelt. And he says, okay, well, my name's Mark and I'm gonna help you. And so I thought, oh God, thank you, Jesus. I thought I'm gonna be here all night. I wasn't hurt, but I was more concerned about uh, my car and what my parents were gonna say because I was still living at home. Uh, so he proceeds to get inside my car and he is completely naked. Yeah, I can laugh about it now, but at the time, I was freaking out. You know, I was like, what is this guy doing? And he's trying to assault you. And when the police come, yeah. what did they do? They, they, I can hear them having a discussion, and they're talking back and forth, saying, well, you know what, she's got to be drunk or on drugs or under the influence of something because she just can flip her car just on her own. And so, you know, I'm, they start the, the, the field sobriety test, and then one of the other officers stops and says, you know what, we don't need to do that. It's, she's not showing any symptoms of, of being under the influence, so he stopped it. Um, so ultimately, I um, get a ride home from two female officers, and it was crickets. It was quiet. It was, there was no sense of um, empathy. And I said, well, do you mind coming inside to talk to my parents because you know, I'm afraid about my car, they're gonna, where's my car, because they had to tow it. I didn't know any of that, you know, my mind is spinning. And they said, oh, really? Do you think they're not gonna believe what happened to you? And just dropped me off in the alley and left. <laughs> so to me, that, you know, left, left a, a lasting impression. Um, and it was something that I decided to share with recruits when I was an instructor in the police academy because I was teaching new recruits. and. I would share that story to demonstrate and tell them that, you know, your first encounter with an officer is a lasting, lifelong impression. And you still remember it. I mean, in fact, even the way you tell it, I can see it as if it was yesterday. And all these years later, and all these years after you wore in the uniform, it still sticks out in your mind. So, of course, the question then becomes, why did you want to become a police officer right. after that? Mm. Yeah, it... It was a challenge, and I thought, you know, I'm not going to be those officers, and I want to be able to make a difference and treat people right. You know, we're, this is our community, and we have to um, work to solve our problems together, and we need the role models, and we need positive contacts with police officers because, you know, the examples that Richard shared are, are valid, you know, because parents tell their kids, oh, there's the police, they're gonna arrest you if you're not good, you know? So we're teaching kids to run from us when we should be teaching them to run towards us for help. Mm -hmm. We're here to help them. Do you think other people, oh, thank you, go ahead, <laughs> give her some, give her her love. Thank you. Do, you think, do you think other people are still coming in the department for the reasons that you did because you wanted to help people and you wanted to change the way people are viewed? Do you think that's still true? I do. I do. I think it takes a special person to be a police officer, especially in today's times. It's challenging. Uh, some people come on the job because uh, it's, a, it's in their family. But for me, there was no one that came from a law enforcement family. So for me, it was something brand new. Um, but my willingness to want to help people and to be able to listen and make a difference, I think there's a lot of officers that, are, that come on the job for that. And, as tough as it is to police in this day and age, we are extremely proud to wear the badge. Um, and in my job, that's one of the things that we're campaigning is to show to the community 
what's behind the badge? You know, I'm a, I'm a mother, mother of two, soccer mom, you know, played sports myself. And, um, but there's a lot of officers that do a lot of good things in their communities on and off duty. And those are the things that I would like to share with the community so that they get to know that we're people, we're real people that, um, you know, care about the job. And we came on the job to work and to serve and protect. That's what we're sworn to do. Deputy, what about you? Deputy, in fact, I'm not even sure how to address you. Is it deputy? Is it pastor? Just don't pastor call me deputy? late for dinner. Just, Just don't, don't call you late for dinner? <laughs> okay. Well, why did you want to be a, a, a sheriff? And which came first, being a, being a minister or being a, a, past, being a, a, a law enforcement? Or do you see the two jobs as related? Yeah, well, now I, I see both the, the jobs combined and related, but I, I needed a job. I needed a job. I was born and raised in Compton, and I had a nice father that said, hey, you just failed out of UCLA, so what are you going to do? And I was like, I'm going to find a job. He says, that's right. And, <laughs> and so I was working at Burger King on El Segundo and Avalon, and uh, the sheriff department came by, and we gave them free food, so they would come by. And uh, we began to talk, uh, the deputy that would come by when I, on my shift, and he said, you seem like a nice guy. You, you ever thought about being a deputy? And I was like, man, I'm from Compton. I live on Piru Street. We don't like the police. We don't <laughs> like the police. And uh, he said uh, at that time, well, I made $50,000 last year. And I said, well, where do I sign up? <laughs> and that's kind of how I, I began going. And then as my career evolved and my ministry evolved, they kind of just go hand in hand because it's all service. No matter how you look at it, it's serving the people, it's having a greater commitment than yourself. It's coming out of yourself and serving someone else that needs the help. And so I find that very, uh, very uh, interesting as I've grown as a law enforcement agent. Who, who do you have in mind when you, th when you say you're serving? Who are you serving? The community, people, people that need us. We're, we are obligated to serve the community and that's what this is all about each and every day from the little kid that's next to you in the car seat that waves to the mother whose car is stranded and you kind of push her over to the side and make sure she has AAA. There, there are a million and one ways that we serve each and every day. But talk to me about what you just said about, look, I'm from Compton and we don't like the police. How did you make that shift in your head to being the police? I was open, I needed a job. So when stress <laughs> comes, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> right, stress comes in your life, right? I had a father, 20 years in the Army, so I, when stress comes in your life, you, you're open to anything that you need to, to, to make things happen. But um, all seriously, we, we just began to, to open up and understand, okay, are the police wrong? I had to at least open my mind up to it and give myself the opportunity to say, hey, let me at least give it a try. Let me see what it's all about because the only thing I know is what I've been told and there's so much misinformation out there that we have to begin to just tell the true story of law enforcement and what it's all about. Okay, we're gonna come back to that. But Yasmin, I wanna hear from you. What's your, how are you hearing this so far? How are you hearing what you're hearing so far? And that's a great question because I was sitting here and felt like I feel this disconnect between um, what I hear with the left side of our panel here and what I hear kind of from um, the folks here to my right. That's a geographic statement, not a political one. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so you know. perfect, isn't it? Um, but I say that to say because me as a black woman and with our organization Black Women Matter, um, you know, for black people, um, the officer friendly doesn't exist. It never has. I don't see officer friendly in my neighborhood. Um, I've never seen that. When I, I think about the first incidences and reflections of my interactions with police, um, it's been seeing family members being beat to a pulp. I can remember an account of uh, my babysitter's son being beat by police so badly that he was never the same afterwards. Um, I see my brother, a D, an honor roll student, captain of his track and field team, who suddenly when he turned 18 and was able to be independent and drive, he stopped for no reason in his own neighborhood. Um, and not only is he stopped, but he stopped for no reason. He's not given a reason as to why. Um, so this, there's a huge disconnect between, I think, what um, officers say and what the community feels and experiences. And that's where we're at this crossroads right now. And that's where we need to take a look at 
how we can really make structural changes in policing so that the community actually feels what you say you went into the police force to actually do. So that way I trust that. Right now there's a huge uh, trust issue and a PR issue. The brand of policing is no good. If you looked at a company that had a brand that was like the police departments across the nation, we would say, that's a brand I wouldn't purchase. So as a consumer and as uh, citizens, and we are not only your consumer, we're your, we, we pay you. Um, and so if we're not feeling good about your reflection, you need to listen to us, you need to hear us, and you need to address the issue so that what you say, that you're here to protect and serve, I can back that up and say, yes, you are here to protect me. Yes, me, hold on, so go ahead. Okay. Okay. Captain Ruby wants to answer that, but before she does, I wanted to ask you, Yasmin, do you have a memory in your head about when your feelings about the police changed? Was there a point at which you thought, when you saw a police officer, you smiled and you felt, yes, they're here for me, and was there a point at which it changed and you thought, no, they're not? Do you remember that moment? I don't remember that moment. I think it was a progression, an erosion um, of a uh, character. So it was, incident after incident. And then it's also growing up and experiencing things firsthand. So I think as black women, we receive things kind of 360 degrees. Not only are our partners, our spouses racially profiled, and we have to worry about that. Um, we have sons, we have nephews, we have to worry about them. And then we also are often victims of police brutality. Just here in Los Angeles, Many of you might be familiar with the Alicia Thomas case that just wrapped up. A black woman, a black mother who was um, unstable and thought she was doing the right thing by surrendering her children to the police department, and ended up being killed. So for, I think, uh, black people, it's you see um, that you never know how a police encounter might go. I asked my brother, I said, what do, you, what do you think of the police? And he said, you know, I just never know what might happen. And I think that says a lot, and we've seen that before, where you could be pulled over and you think you might just be getting a ticket, and the next thing you know that you're a hashtag, and there's a problem with that. Captain Ruby, what about it? Go ahead, go ahead. Mm. Captain Malachi, you grew up, you came of age in the Rodney King era, right? Right. So mm -hmm. tell me, yeah. what do you think about well, that, what, what Yasmin just said? You know, you bring up a lot of uh, valid, um, valid points, and when I came on the job almost 21 years ago, and I would work gangs, and if, you know, someone ran from us, you know, we'd catch them at the end, and then I'd talk to them, and I'd say, well, why did, why, why did you run? And, you know, they said, well, we were afraid they were, you were gonna beat us, or, you know, we were just scared. And eventually, you know, we work on those relationships over the years, and they don't run, and they say, you know what, I didn't run because you're cool, you know, or they get to know you. Um, and that's the goal, that's the end goal that, you know, that Yasmin brings up, that the relationships that we need to have and, and to communicate with. And there's, you know, it's, it's it, what you're saying is, is valid, and we recognize that as a law enforcement agency, and that, there is a disconnect. There is, and there's, still, sure, still, there, there is, and I think we've just gone full circle. Things got better. We went put under the consent decree. We were mandated to withhold certain standards, which are now our best practices, and we continue to move forward with those. But we're policing in a much different um, age and manner, where we're challenged with you know social media where you, we have an, an incident, a critical incident, and it's all over the news, and we haven't been given the opportunity to give any, our message out. The challenging part about giving the message out and giving the transparent appearance about the department is that you know, the, we have different mandates where officers have Bill of Rights, where we can't give out their name and, and certain things about um, the incidents. We can't compromise a, in a case before we put information out. So we're, we're challenged with social media, um, you know, the, the, the policing well, today well, well, is I'm difficult. I'm gonna challenge you on mm -hmm. that. When in the back, so basically you're saying you preferred it back in the day when the law enforcement were the only people who got to get their story oh, out? Oh, no, 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 I'm not, okay. I, I recognize that so. we're, we're, 
Let, I mean, because isn't this just about leveling the playing field, really? Because no. back when I was a police reporter, mm -hmm. when I was a fetus, um, <laughs> um, the first people you heard from were always law enforcement. So they were the ones right. who got their story out first. So you're saying that Correct. you prefer that? No, that's no, not at all. In fact, I, I say that we recognize that times yeah. have changed in terms of reporting yeah. and, and social media and internet um, gets the word out so much quicker and faster with the power of video, all those things. So those things where law enforcement has to become current with current time, technology, and getting the information out and educating the, the community in how we work and understanding each other. Um, you know, we welcome what we're doing right now and we welcome the community to, to be a part of this is that we put them through different uh, training scenarios, put you in our shoes, just so that we understand each other, not to try to justify what we're doing, but um, you know, I would wanna go into your community and get to know you and understand what your issues and concerns are so that we can work together. And we ask the same, that we at least see eye to eye. We use, you know, our, our gang interventionists, that's one of our, model programs in trying to reduce crime and it's, and it's worked. And other law enforcement agencies are really critical of it because they think, wow, you guys are talking with gang members and working together with them. But it's, we recognize we have two different roles, you know, and, and the end goal is that we both want to save lives. Let, let me ask for Sam about this. I mean, you've, since you've been covering this from when you were a little baby reporter too. Right, and I so was two when I started. You were two when you started, yeah, yeah. So, so was I. So, um, could barely pick up a pencil. <laughs> what, do you, what do you see? I mean, has um, anything yeah. changed? Has anything changed? Oh, Lord, of course, it's night and day. It's not, it's not even the, I mean, I think there is a very, very strong argument to be made that the, that the uh, institution in California life that has changed most profoundly of any anywhere in the state is LAPD. I mean, LAPD, go through, I invite you to sit in a station house, which I've done before, waiting for, for uh, uh, someone to uh, tend to me, a lieutenant, I'm there to interview or whatever. Uh, the racial and gender makeup of the LAPD is just not even remotely uh, comparable to uh, 20 years ago, I would suppose, something like that. Um, I'll tell you, um, what the captain was referring to, these community academies are, fa are fascinating things to go, to go see. I've been to one um, where, um, you know, the community is invited to do a 10-week academy, so they basically learn the basics of, of, of community policing, well, or, or policing the way, the way LAPD does it. And you may know that, that the LAPD has a very notorious history with regard to uh, gay and lesbian folks, particularly in the Hollywood area, uh, for years, decades, you know, it was more like just beat the crap out of them and send them to, send them to prison, busting up gay bars, all this kind of thing. There was real deep tension and, and frustration. Um, I, th I think it was 2011, uh, I was covering a little bit of the, what was going on, going on in Hollywood, and there was an LGBT community academy. So folks from the community, prim primarily Hollywood, my understanding was, mm -hmm. uh, took a 10-week community academy. Now this is held at the police academy in front of the, right at the entrance to the police academy is a bronze bust of Daryl Gates. You all know who Daryl Gates was, sure. right? The, the police chief, who was frankly, in my view, kind of a notorious police chief, honestly. He, he seemed to, to represent all that was wrong with policing. His that, that bust was there, I couldn't believe it. I said, wow, this is weird. But then, what just, this was like a, kind of the, the, the way things have changed. I sat through the graduation of that community academy. LGBT community academy, 20 yards from the bust of Daryl Gates. The valedictorian for the community academy was a transgender woman from Cal State Northridge. I mean, Daryl Gates was spinning in his grave over that. You know, and this so, was a man, you know, I don't so, know if you know who Daryl Gates was. Absolutely, but, I've interviewed him several times. I did right. interview him several times before he yeah. passed away. But he, but he was, uh, he was this, this force for let's just go blast them, Operation Hammer, arresting or detaining hundreds of people at a time. Uh, I think, it, I'm no, I have no doubt that, that abuses go on and mistakes go on all the time. This is a, a human-driven occupation. 
but but the but the the, the so idea, you think that the, things have changed particularly for the LGBT community. What about for Black and Brown people? I mean, who I, are not LGBT? I, I think I think I think where race is their primary. Look, I was in I was in uh, in uh, on Drew Street. Uh, I spent a lot of time on a street called Drew Street, um, which in its day was the worst two blocks of Los Angeles, the most dangerous two blocks of Los, Los Angeles. Nothing, uh, only Mexican and Central American immigrants mostly. Dominated by it, an extraordinarily aggressive gang who kind of hibern kind of took control of apartment complexes there uh, on the street, two blocks long. Mm -hmm. And the police uh, uh, waged a battle, I would say, along with the city uh, for years to get, to get rid of this gang. Finally, what actually did work was a combination of uh, RICO indictment, uh, federal indictment for racketeering against uh, what eventually became many dozens of, of, of the gang members, particularly along that street, followed by, extraordinarily important, followed by uh, a, 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 a new approach, uh, a community policing approach, walking the, the beat, for I think three months, four months, cutting down the shoes, uh, painting over the graffiti, doing a lot of things that, that had been do done, but now all these bad guys were away. So it was a combination of, of uh, law enforcement, the way we traditionally understand it, um, with, with this federal uh, indictment, along with, followed by the community. Now, you can go out to Drew Street, I invite you to go out to Drew Street. You could not have done what I've been able to do I go out there every couple of months just to monitor. I've been doing that for like three, four years now. Drew Street is so different, and, and I guarantee you, the feeling on that, on that street is hallelujah, thank you, to the police department, to the city also, because the city um, bought a house, for, uh, or didn't buy it, took a house from the, the matriarch of the, of the street, knocked it down as a community garden. Now these kinds of police, this kind of policing is the kind of policing I don't think Daryl Gates ever uh, imagined or could, could envision or could, 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 ima uh, could conceive of. Um, I think this is, this kind of policing is going on, um, I, I think in, across uh, uh, Los Angeles. I would say one other thing that's fascinating to me is the transformation of the Captain Three job. Captain Three, is the station house commander, who normally, for many years, my, my understanding is, you know, once you've been on the job 30 years, basically, okay, this is your time to go play golf. You're not really a, a force, you're not really a presence in the station house, you just go do your thing. Captain Three has been transformed in, in LAPD into community, those are community organizers. That's what those folks do. It's in a remarkable job that they, they are out there looking for, uh, Blight, they call um, uh, the city department to remove the, the sofas. They're developing alliances with pastors and principals and, and, uh, and, and local uh, uh, homeowners and so on. It's, it's a job that is, my understanding, 12 hours a day job. It's not, it's, and so you've got this transformation that I believe is, is radical. Captain, does that sound right to you? And I'm gonna hear from others on this. Does that sound right to you? So the job as a commander, in the community is different than lock people up, go by the numbers. What are the incentives for you now? I mean, what is the incentive for excellence in the department now? I mean, it used to be in a lot of departments, the number of arrests is how you got your stripes, right? Is it the number of arrests? What is it that, no, what's, no, the, what's the metric for success for you now? The, you know, the mindset has changed over the years where, you know, back in the, in the past, it was certain ranks, certain role um, to, build those community partnerships but now in the with our current command especially with chief beck he's really his message and his expectation is that everyone has an equal part um and everyone is accountable to build those relationships regardless of your rank but how do you how do you measure that how do you measure these relationships well it's not by it, it, the crime reduction has always been the measure but we can't keep chasing last year's numbers and um, the true measure is going to be in the absence of crime and what our community tells us when we don't have that disconnect and where we can work together so that we can work together towards a common goal so that regardless of what the crime rates are in your neighborhood, the question would be, do you feel safe in your neighborhood? Do you know your police officers? Do you, are you active in 
solving some of those problems because it, it, it has to be our community. It's not just us versus them. And that's what, the way we have to approach it. In well, the, let me the ask way we some do. of the other community members. Richard, how do you hear this? Do you, how do you hear this? I, I mean, I, I think um, things are not as worse as, as they used to be, but I still see the problems there. Um, my family is still suffering from gang violence and drugs, and, and it's a problem that I still see in the neighborhoods. And um, that's, just, that's just honest truth. Um, um, my, you think the gangs are still a factor in people's quality of life and their ability to live the way they want to live, are they? In your family's life? You think gang life is still, not for you personally, because you, you know, you're, right. big, you're big time. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, for people you grow up with, other family members, people who They still struggle. People, people are struggling And is, and is gang life still a part of that? The gangs pressing on you, is that still a part of it? I, I, I don't mean, I don't know if pressing on you, but it's, it's, it's valid. I, I come from Homeboy Industries. That, that's, where, that, that's, that's where kind of stuff changed. Mm -hmm. um, Father Greg, um, that, that, that's, that's the man that, that, that changed these thousands of gang members that walk into this place. And um, it's compassion, you know, it, it, it's, it's really just, that's what he instills in us to, 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 to just give us a chance, you know, we really care about w w w what is happening. And um, there's thousands of gang members still struggling because I'm at Homeboys day in, day out, and there's, there's new faces, and, and it, it, it's, it's still happening. And yeah, that's... So we have two issues here. Mm -hmm. One is... Is gang life still a part of life that has to be dealt Michelle, with? And the other just, issue, go ahead, Louise. And then, and then the, yeah. the other issue is the other issue wanted that brought us a lot of a lot of us here today, which yeah. is that the the hashtag Black Lives Matter originated here out of a sense that Black lives don't matter enough. Right. And so those are the two issues that we're we're dealing with. But, here. but let me so, say something about Louise? the gangs. I do think it's important to point out that the police have changed. There is gang intervention that wasn't existing. But you know why? Because we've been doing gang intervention for 40 years. Mm -hmm. Because there's been people like Father Greg, homeboys, other people who've been out there with no support, no money, trying to change kids' lives. We have proven to people that you can change their lives without putting them away. And, um, and if there's a shift, it's because we've been doing it and the shift is moving our way. I have to say that because I'm glad there's a shift. But it wasn't out of a vacuum. The other thing that we've got to confront is our communities are being gentrified. Our communities are being pushed out. It isn't just police. It's a whole package of things going out there. We're losing most African Americans in this city. They're being pushed to Lancaster, Palmdale, Riverside County. They're being pushed out. Uh, East LA, the same thing. Areas are being pushed out. Highland Park, big gentrification. So I think that has to be taken into account along with the whole thing that in the last few years, that instead of helping these communities, instead of helping the homeless, instead of doing something, it's been squeezing our communities. And that to me is not the way to go. We should have kept our communities intact and kept their communities strong. Sam, okay. do you want to speak um, on that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was a very, very interesting topic and very uh, um, rich uh, uh, thing to talk about. Um, the, the truth is, gang, presence in Los Angeles is, a, is a, like a faint shadow of what it once was. Mm -hmm. It's almost, you can, the reason Highland Park is gentrifying is because it, the gangs are no longer there. Gangs are your best rent control, the, better than any law. Because who wants to live near a gang? Nobody. So that, the rents stay low if you have a gang. Now those gangs are gone. That's why rents, all, Drew Street is a perfect example. Houses, when I went there in 2007 and eight. In the, or just before the house, burst of the housing bubble, I talked to a Salvadoran man who had tried to sell his house. He could not sell it. The house was worth effectively zero. Now he doesn't want to leave because the gangs are basically gone, and he's got um, uh, neighbors who have bought the houses on, on that block. I talked to him, $300,000, $350,000. So I think if you go across um, Southern California, um, you will see, it's not just LA, you will see in it a, a sea change, a sea change. Go to places like Cudahy, go to Flor uh, Florencia 13 area, uh, go to Hawaiian Gardens, go to, um, I'm not saying it's every place, and the reason is not, does not always, does not have to do with the police frequently. There well, what's, are well, what's the chicken, what's the egg? I mean, is it that the gang presence is diminished 
because they can't afford to live here anymore? No. The, the, and because they've several, been priced out? Or I, is I it, or is it, or are they, or are they out because of other factors? No, and I think there are the several factors. Are... There are several factors. One of them definitely is, I believe, a focus on community policing, uh, an attempt to, uh, by just traditional law enforcement, particularly uh, RICO indictments that have done a, a marvelous job, I believe, in, in sending the worst gang members off to prison. However, there's a, there are other issues. One of them, I frankly believe, uh, certainly in Latino neighborhoods, is that the Mexican Mafia prison gang has also played a, a, a role and, and people are, uh, gangs are, are retreating off the street. Doesn't mean they don't exist. Doesn't mean they don't exist. But if you're not public, our street, we invented street gang culture the way it's known today in, in Southern California. It's very much about owning the street. Domi all, all, so many gangs are named for streets. I know they're no longer there. The parks are, go to MacArthur Park, go to Highland Park, uh, Sycamore Park, go to all, uh, numerous parks, Roosevelt Park and Florencia area. You will find parks that are free and clear, kids playing in them. You don't have that if gangs are there. Part of it is a lot of gangs have retreated to doing business. They're not so much about the, the tit for tat shootouts that used to bring lots of police heat and, and, and destroy neighborhoods. That's a big part of it. A lot of them are now just wanting to sell drugs in private and, and not bring, bring police heat. I do believe a, a, an important part of the component, though, is that there, are, uh, there is now policing, community policing, real community policing, reaching out for alliances with neighborhoods, with leaders in those neighborhoods, with business people, small business folks. Okay. All those uh, uh, factors are part of a community policing. That's Let part me ask of you this. On. The Guardian which is a UK-based media organization, yeah. has done an analysis of all the police-involved deaths over right. the course of the year. Mm -hmm. They found that the LAPD has been involved with the largest number of deaths of any police department in the country mm -hmm. this year. Mm -hmm. Why is that? I don't know. I well, don't know. I, I think that's why we need to bring in the other side. It what? doesn't feel that way, the way Sam has explained this. I don't, I think there's been a big repression. I think our prisons are filled with a lot of kids that shouldn't be there. Uh, we have the largest prison system in the country. But, and well, I but think Luis, with all due respect though, the people, people who are in prison, that's one issue. But police being, people being killed outside of prison on the street, particularly when they are unarmed, is another issue, and yeah, I'd like and us to focus Especially when majority are black and brown, moment. and I think that's why I think the issue is still well, real. Well, you know, ironically, let me, just, let me share this with you, because according to the Guardian's analysis, actually the largest number of people who were killed in encounters with the police were white. According to the Guardian's numbers, this, this year, of the 464 people who were killed in encounters with the police, 50% were white, 29% were black, and 14% were Hispanic and Latino. No, this is nationally. nationally. The difference is that African Americans were more likely to be unarmed when they were killed in encounters with the police, by far. Right. By far. And those are the there's encounters that I think have brought yeah, a lot of us here today. There's another statistic that the Youth Justice Coalition came out with yeah. since the year 2000. In LA alone, 621 people mm -hmm. have been killed. The majority were unarmed. The more than 50% were Latino, mm -hmm. but the disproportionate number were black. And so I think there's still an issue that we have to face head on. And that's what I want to hear. Yeah. What, why is that? Captain, do you want to tell us why is that? <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of variables that, that go into a, an officer involved shooting. And so without getting into policy and all those things, um, I'd, I'd want to comment on the, the community policing issue with our, our gang um, gang problem, where if LAPD has seen a, a huge reduction in crime, in gang crime, which is a huge um, reduction in our violent crime because LAPD's most violent crimes are usually gang related. So our partnership with, with our gang interventionists and with Homeboy Industries it's not a one-way street. I mean, they have done a lot to help us in the community. In fact, tonight's the kickoff for our Summer Night Lights program where you can go to a park and you're not gonna be you know, stopped for a gang injunction or curfew or anything like that, but you're there to interact and, and they wanna help their own communities too. So that's the, the joint effort and 
I think that's a start, you know, and something that we need to continue to build on. Captain, I respect you greatly, but I'd like you to answer my question, which is why, <laughs> which is that the issue that has brought a lot of us here today and that has engaged so many people around the country is the question of people, particularly unarmed people, dying in encounters with the police. And in fact, there was a shooting just recently, last week as I understand mm -hmm. it, of a man who apparently was asking for help who was then that, according to the reports that I have seen, can you help us understand this from your perspective? Well, just keep in mind, when you look at, at deaths uh, at the hands of, the of law enforcement, our laws and policies vary from state to state. So um, other states have different shooting policies than ours, and with LAPD, we have one of the most strict um, shooting policies. So this most recent incident, I. I don't have the specifics on it because we I had been been to the to the briefing on it, so I and it's still under investigation, so I won't be able to to comment on specifically. I did hear the same as what I read in the paper in terms of the he was, um, uh, uh, he had a towel wrapped someone down. His hand. Yeah, so so you don't know. No, I I don't know. And part of that is once the facts are available, and we can put it out. That's where. You know, it is hoped that we can put together those scenarios so that we can train the, the community, not train the community, but educate and share some of the different situations that, we, that would warrant a shooting or that would warrant different levels of use of force. And that's a, a huge campaign that we're beginning is to share and educate what our use of force policy is. Okay. Sheriff, what about you? Do you want to shed some light on this? This specific incident doesn't involve your department, but that is an issue that I guarantee you, if you go to your family reunion in August, this is one of the things that they will be talking about. Oh, so, absolutely. So absolutely. tell us what your thoughts are about well, this. Like I tell everyone, I'm human, and every police officer out there is human. And, and so it's, it's a very scary thing. No one wakes up going, I want to shoot somebody. I want to shoot an unarmed man. No one wakes up saying that because after that you have dreams, they take your gun, you may lose your job. So all of these things are now in our briefing. Hey, treat everybody right or you're going to get days off. Hey, do this. All of this goes on and gets repeated every day in briefing. When Before we go out, they don't even say be safe as much. They go, hey, all right, wear your seatbelt, treat the community right, or you're going to get days off. So. In the back of every law enforcement's mind, every person's mind, we're out there to do our job, but I'm going home. I got a beautiful wife, six kids, and I'm gonna take care of my family. And if I perceive danger from my life, I'm gonna do what I need to do to take it. Now that may seem bad, but if you were on the other side and you have grandchildren and family, and I'm a good man, but if I perceive danger, I'm going to do what it takes to protect myself and my partner. And so it's a humanistic side that we're forgetting. Nobody's RoboCop. And so what we have to understand is different situations and circumstances. And so I won't comment on a specific area. But what I will say is everyone has feelings, emotions, and perceptions. And it is easy to sit back and go, that shouldn't have happened when you're not the one fighting for your life or in the middle of that. And so what I'm asking everybody to do is just understand that I am human and every police officer out there is human as well. Yasmin, you had something you wanted to add? I do. Um, I think we're missing also you know, a critical uh, kind of obvious point here and that's really driven the Black Lives Matter movement and that is that this happens repeatedly to black people who are killed when they're unarmed and that we do not see the same treatment to non-black people, specifically white people, okay, by police. And so we have seen, for example, just last month, the biker gang shootout where nine people were killed and we saw how the police there treated killers, okay? And you contrast that with just a few hundred miles away, the way that Eric Casebolt treated and sat on a 14-year-old black girl, okay? Drug her by her hair. We, everyone in this audience knows he would not have done that to a white girl, okay? So we're missing a key component here, and there is racial bias. Um, at play. Everyone knows that. Um, it is only people who are in denial who do not want to completely restructure how police operate. And I believe that one of the ways that you can actually change this is changing how we recruit 
officers to police work. So this means not training them while they're there, okay? I don't want to have someone in my police academy who has attitudes towards Latinos and blacks and people who are undervalued and marginalized. I want people there who have had maybe a sociology class, read maybe one of Luis's books. You know, I want people there who have an appreciation and understanding for diversity, especially here in Los Angeles. This is the melting pot of the world. Um, we're not addressing those issues. Okay. I think we're trying to address them after the fact, Michelle. We need to look at completely how we're recruiting the talent that want to be police officers. And I think that starts with looking at, do we want college educated police officers? You know what? We train physicians because they are, they have people's lives in their hands. They have to go to school for a minimum of eight years. We train lawyers in the same manner, six years minimum. Why? Because they're entrusted with people's freedoms. Police officers are entrusted with people's freedoms. They need to know the Constitution, in my opinion, just as well as a lawyer. We have police arresting people who are exercising their constitutional rights. That cannot happen. If, okay. If you're just joining us, I'm Michelle Martin of NPR News, and together with member station KPCC, tonight we're hearing personal stories of police and community. As I mentioned, it's a collaboration between NPR and member station KPCC right here in Los Angeles. You can join us online using the hashtag Streets and Beats, and because we've been having this conversation both here in the audience and in our larger audience, I think this would be a good time to hear from people and hear what's, what's going on. What are people talking about outside of this hall. We've been asking what could improve relations between police and the communities they serve. Yes, you just brought us to that, to that question. And uh, that is, if you think they need improving, because we also recognize that some people might not agree with this statement and probably don't. Some people probably do not agree with the statement that relationships need improving. And I'd love to hear, Frank, are you ready to, to join us? I am ready. I want to check on the conversation happening on social media right now. And Frank Stoltz is KPCC's reporter on criminal justice and public safety issues. Frank, what, what are you hearing? What are you seeing? Uh, there's tons of comments, uh, spirited discussion, 700 posts from across the country. Uh, I'll start actually here, though, where an LAPD officer, Leon Joseph, who patrols Skid Row, talking about uh, in his Twitter feed, fear justifies the use of deadly force. Cops are human. A badge does not make you invincible. Later, he says, fear of injury and death would cause a regular citizen to fear. Cops are no different. Uh, which is interesting because I, I don't know how much you've gotten into that, that, that fear and then how often uh, the fear is justified because a lot of folks are unarmed. Uh, and so it's unjustified fear, obviously, sometimes. From New York, uh, Jack Jackalone, a former uh, NYPD, uh, NYPD detective, now John Jay. As a society, we need to be rebuilding the institutions of family, religion, and school in order to prevent crime. There were a number of comments about not just police accountability, but also uh, community accountability. What could communities do and leaders do uh, to prevent incidents? Um, St. Petersburg, Florida officer Matt Enhofer. I be uh, he became a police officer because my dad was a cop and I worked with youth and church and I saw it as a way to help people. And I talked to plenty of police officers who got into the business to help people. Uh, and, and one more from uh, Matre, who's a hip hop artist in LA and has actually uh, seen some of the live stream from a juvenile detention center in LA uh, where he's, he's running a, a poetry workshop for kids. And he says a lot of the kids are telling him they just feel judged by police. That they go in there, there's no support. It's like, we're gonna hammer you and, and we're gonna punish you and, and there's no real support. So that's, that's some of the discussion on social media. And uh, I'll just add personally that, um, you know, I was in uh, the housing projects of Watts here a couple days ago, uh, where there, there are foot beats. These cops stay there for five years. They get to know the community. Uh, and the community knows them, and uh, there are fewer shootings, there are fewer uh, mistakes, but, but that's the exception at the LAPD. It's come a long way, but there are plenty of folks who say it has not come near far enough.
So you're saying there have been a number of things that have been changed. There have been a number of policies that have been put into place to forge better relationships and stronger relationships, but there's still a lot of people who feel that there is that still that disconnect is there, and there are a lot of people who have both perspectives. Can I just ask you this, Frank? I was speaking to the captain about this, and I wanted to ask you that about the incident last week where the LAPD shot a man in the head. His name is Walter William DeLeon. He was reportedly signaling for help, but he had a towel wrapped around his hand, and apparently the officers believed that there was a weapon in his hand. So what's the latest on this? Is there anything more you can tell us about this story? Well, we know that he was somehow flagging them down. We don't know why, because he's in critical condition in the hospital, and detectives have not been able to speak to him, not been able to get a statement, as far as I know. Uh, but this is a classic you know, shooting where people are going, why did the officers shoot? He was unarmed. And uh, somehow getting into that discussion of that, that space where the officer is fearful, but the fear is unwarranted. It, it is misplaced fear. I, I, of course most cops don't want to shoot people. Uh, there was an incident out in, in Venice where somehow an officer felt fearful, and the chief has actually criticized this one, and he shot dead a homeless man in Venice who was unarmed. So um, it continues to happen, and I, I suppose that's why we're having this discussion today, right? Let me ask this, and then I'm gonna, uh, I, I would love to hear from Luis. Did you wanna share a poem with us? But before we yeah. did, just picking up on this one issue, the question I have is, are police officers trained properly in what to fear and what not to fear? Are they trained to fear certain people when perhaps that's not what they should fear? Yeah. Are they trained to fear people as opposed to behavior? I'm asking you, what do you think well, about that? Uh, do you wanna? That's, so fear and perception and all of those things is, can be generally trained. However, you still have the personal fear from the individual. So what is that person going through? How were they raised? What, what did they go through in their life? So even though I have this box of what I'm supposed to do, I still have some certain uh, things that I'm afraid of. I'm, like, I'm afraid of dogs. I'm terrified of dogs. And so uh, a dog come, my partner, he's going to laugh. He goes up to the dog because he's been around dogs. But I, I'm afraid of dogs. So when you start talking about fears, those are things that people have individually. And so um, it, we can sit back and kind of talk about all those things and, and like it's really simple, but it's not really simple. It's a very complicated. What about Yasmin's suggestion, which interestingly, if we've been collecting questions from the audience about that, and a number of people have actually made the point about higher education requirements and the kind of training, perhaps. What about Yasmin's suggestion that actually there needs to be more training how you know those people, people that, how do job? you know those people that, are, that uh, did shoot aren't educated and don't have four-year degrees? How do you know that? Mm -hmm. And so, it, it, I mean, everything is great when we're sitting here, but we, the, the practicality is out there in the car when I'm working, when, when I'm out there. And so you don't get time to talk and, and wonder and figure. It, it's, it's happening like that, and, and you got to make a decision. And so I understand what everyone is saying, but until you're in that car and you understand the, the, the fear that's going on or the, just whatever's taking place, we have to make snap decisions in a moment's notice. And so I have to gather all the information that's going on, and I have to make a decision. Whether that decision is right or wrong afterwards, that's the community and uh, my okay. superiors and everyone. And sometimes we get it wrong because we are human. But the consequences of your getting it wrong are different than yeah. the consequences of me getting it wrong. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. That's why it takes a special person to do this job okay. that, that will say, I'm going to go out there anyway, even if I do get it wrong, because I'm doing it from my heart. I am serving. Okay. All right. And so if we look at it from that point, and that's what I'm asking everybody to look at it from the point that people are serving. Now, are there bad cops? Yeah, there are bad cops out there. Do we need to change? I agree with all of that. But what I'm saying is, as a community, if we don't begin to reach to each other, all right, because this is great, but as I always say, how many of you know your patrol officer in your area? How many of you have asked your patrol officer in your area to come over to your house for a bottle of water? 
And so because the relationship is not together, we will never, because what brings us together is relationship. Me knowing you and I know your son and your daughter, and so that has to come together, and okay. that's what we're missing as a society. Let's, let's, let's hear from Luis. Luis wants to tell us, give us a, a poem, and then for, I'm gonna ask each of you your thoughts about what would make things better. I think that's a really good way to go next. So, Luis, so, will you share a thought with us? I guess the, this poem has to do with the fact that all of us are human, including the gang kids, including kids that people don't, uh, there's no bad guys. I hate that because I see it in TVs. These are the bad guys. These are our families. These are, there may be trouble, they may need help. I was one of those people. And I was somebody who was troubled. And I did some bad things and I will cop to it. I don't mind taking responsibility for what I did. But the police have to take responsibility because they need to be held to a higher level. One is when I was 16, I was put in murder's row for murders I didn't do. I was put next to Charles Manson. I was put into an adult facility even though I was 16. I was put there for days and days on end even though there was no charges filed. I was beaten. I was maced in the sheriff's uh, deputies, I mean the sheriff's bus, handcuffed. Uh, I saw others beaten. I was 16 years old. This, I'm a human being. I was pissed off. But here's what I did. In the long run, I decided I'm not going to go to war with my community. I'm not going to go to war with the police. I'm going to fight for justice. I'm going to work with the community. I'm going to teach people that there's another way to go. And I did a poem. That poem was first written when I was in that facility. And it's about the calling, being called to another life, to fight for beauty, for bounty, for the goodness in, our, in all humanity, including in police officers, but especially in our communities. Because as far as I'm concerned, Ezra Ford was human. So was Eric Garner, so was Michael Brown. All of them are human, and humans are killing humans. And some people need to be held accountable for that. So let me read you the poem, and I hope it gives the message. The calling came to me while I languished in my room. While I withered away my youth in jail cells and damp vario fields, it brought me to life out of captivity in a street scarred tattooed place I call body. Until then I waited silently, a deafening clamor in my head, voiceless to all around, hidden from America's eyes, a brown boy without a name. I would sing into a solitary tape recorder, music never to be heard. I would write my thoughts in scrambled English. I would take photos in my mind, plan out new parks, bushy green, concrete free, new places to play and think. Waiting, then it came, the calling. It brought me out of my room. It forced me to escape night captures and street prisons. It called me to war to be scientists and march with the soldiers of change. It called me from the shadows, out of the wreckage of my barrio, from among those who did not exist. I waited all of 16 years for this time. Somehow, unexpected, I was called. And that is why you are the Poet Laureate of Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> we have about 20 minutes left and we've raised so many issues and I'd love to bring it home. Uh, and also we're gonna hear another another bit of, of performance from uh, Richard Cabral, and we also have a wonderful performance coming up for you, which may be a surprise to some of you. You see there's a band uh, set up over there, and you are going to want to stay for that. In the time that we have left, I would love to hear from each of you about what would make it better, so that we, as much as I, I love our time together, so if we come together five years from now, we're talking about something else. So Sam, what would make it better? Um. Well, it's a really good question. I think two things, uh, one in general and one specific. Uh, it has long struck me that we as a society have beh behaved with enormous uh, cowardice when it, when it comes to the police. We foist everything we don't want to do. A, a common, a typical police officer strikes me as an amazing uh, study. I'm fascinated as a journalist by by uh, what goes into being, a, you have to be a marriage counselor, a youth counselor, sometimes an employment counselor. You have to, you have to know, uh, prim, uh, above all, I think one of the main issues that, that, that uh, police have to deal with is you have to be a mental health professional. We, we, we as a society have foisted every problem that we don't want to deal with onto police officers. I believe that the 
but primarily, the, the, a major one that causes so many problems is mental health issues. Police officers are, and jailers are our mental health professionals, effectively. And, and that is an outrage. That is just so ridiculous. It is, it is putting in the hands of, uh, uh, of people who are really not trained for that, who have a gun, who are not trained to deal with, with people with schizophrenia or uh, drug-induced psychosis or all these kinds of things. And, and yet, when, when that goes bad, as it will absolutely go bad, um, I'm amazed it doesn't go bad far more often, we then decide that it's okay to sit back and, well, you really screwed up, man. What were you thinking? I would have handled it differently. Mm -hmm. That's the most absurd comment I've ever heard. I mean, this is, this is a serious issue. We have basically washed our hands. It reminds me very much, uh, uh, well, there are parallels that say this, to the way we handled the uh, Iraq and Afghanistan wars. We, we put in the hands of a very few people this thing, go, go fight that war for us. We don't really want to be bothered. Thank you very much. And I believe in, in some ways this is, there are parallels to the way we as a society have very cowardly, in a very cowardly manner, handled particularly the mental health issue. And this, I think, is what leads to enormous problems uh, on the street because there is no good, there frequently is no good way to deal with people who are, who are unbalanced or don't see reality the way you see that, you know. <laughs> Number two, uh, when, when it comes to police shootings, um, uh, I believe that we, do, we have, we have um, learned enormous amounts about all a, a variety of, uh, of, of aspects of law enforcement and crime and crime, how crime works through basic analysis of, of big data. Uh, that, that's what CompStat is, the, the computer statistic, the, 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 issue, the, the, the accumulation of that. And, and, um, and we do not know, for example, um, how many of these shootings were in low light. That would be a very, very interesting thing to know. Because if it's in low light, there are ways of dealing with that, perhaps. Um, I, I would be interested to know the race of the people who, the, of the police officers overall, who have shot all these people. I would bet they're going to be mostly Latino, because that's an, an enormous number of people on, on, on the force. I would like to know these questions, and I believe the police, officer, police departments across the country have done themselves an enormous disservice by not studying it in depth. Once you study it in depth, frequently, solutions present themselves very clearly when otherwise you're just walking around blind. Optimistic or pessimistic, Sam, when you think about the trajectory? Oh, I'm, I've, I've viewed the way the tra trajectory of policing over the last 20, 30 years, and it has certainly improved. It's gotten much better. I'm, I'm, I'm certainly optimistic okay. that this can happen. Captain Ruby Mel. Hi, Sam Quinones. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being part of this conversation. Captain? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Sam. Mm -hmm. um, just to comment on, on Yasmeed's um, comments and, or recommendations, we, we as a police department pride ourselves on our training in, a, in, in our academy. Uh, we are probably the, one of the most diverse uh, departments in the nation. Uh, we do have educational requirements, but also just a quick note on what we train. We train our officers to, to react based on action, not based on race. Um, recently, we had a community academy, and we put them through a little um, force option, option simulator, and we asked everybody, and it, they end up shooting an unarmed person, and the question posed to the, the citizen that was the shooter, um, what race was the person that you shot that was unarmed, and they said, Oh, I don't know. And then they say, so you, I, I think, you know, to put them in our shoes and have to make those split second decisions is, is something that needs to happen more often and we need to continue that dialogue. And I just ask that, you know, you, you give us a chance. We're not perfect, we're not cut from the same cloth and I think that's what makes our department unique and our city unique is that we're diverse. We mirror the, the, the community, but it doesn't mean that we're, you know, perfect either. So we need to learn how to, to understand each other and see how we can continue those good practices that we've seen in, in Watts um, with our community safety partnership. You know, those are proven programs that, that work. Uh, we're starting with the youth, a lot of youth programs, and we want to carry that citywide to continue to build those relationships, number one, but number two also so that we get those kids before they enter that gang or, or you know, those kids that are at risk those are the kids we need to help save because those are our future, and they could become future police officers. They could be anything they want. Five years from now, Captain Ruby, if we get together, will we still be talking about this, optimistic or pessimistic? 
I'm optimistic. I think it will still be a discussion. We're humans, you know, it's part of the human race and, and things change and uh, demographics change in LA. And hopefully when we're talking again in five years, we'll have more women on the department as well. All right. <laughs> Captain Ruby Malachi, LAPD, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, I would like everyone just to reach out to your local law enforcement. Find out, first of all, to your community. Find out who's on your block. Social media and the computer has kind of taken away everyone watering their grass and talking to each other across the grass. So reach out to your community members, your neighbors, and everyone like that, first of all. And then get a block club started on your street. And then call your local captain. And, and don't ask for your captain to come. Ask for the patrol officer. There hasn't been a captain that's been involved in a shooting in a long time. It's been patrol officers. So ask for your patrol officers to come down. Get to know them. Offer them some water. They probably won't eat any food you make, right? Because the trust issue with both of us, right? But get some water. <laughs> Offer them some water, right? But what you want to do is begin to build the relationship. Um, and, and we will come out. People want to come out. We, we want to be liked. We really do. We, I, I want to be liked by the community. And so reach out. And then once you begin to reach out, tell your friends and neighbors. And then we have to be accountable to our own community, all right, and to our own young men, our own young women. So if you see something, say something. Talk to them. Th those are our kids. So don't drive by them. Ask them to pull over to the side. Hey, I'm trying to drive by. Pull over. Say something. Because if you leave it all to the police and we're not here, then something always big happens. So, but the community has the power. You guys have the power. And if you guys come together with us and we get together and then we become one community, not law enforcement, not the community, but we are, we are, then we'll see a change in our communities, in our cities. Optimistic or pessimistic? You know, I'm, I'm excited about the future. And all this chaos, I believe something good has to come out of this. And everything that's going on, something good has to come out of this. You guys come to Compton, I'm excited. Okay, Deputy Sheriff Rafer Owens and Pastor from Compton, thank you for joining us. Yasmeen, what would make it better? What would make it better? I think a couple of things. One, people getting involved, um, getting involved in their own communities, also going to elected officials. If you see things, if you notice patterns, uh, go to your elected officials. They're there to serve you, and they are listening at a, a time where people are very sensitive to the issues of um, the overcriminalization of black and brown people. You know, there are 2.3 million people incarcerated right now. One million of those are black people. I don't know the statistic for Latinos, but I'm sure it's an overrepresentation. Um, you know, we had this conversation kind of talk about gang involvement. There's this misconception that the people who um, are stopped by police officers kind of deserve to be stopped because they're gang bangers or they might have gang affiliations. The truth of the matter is, when we look at recent killings of unarmed people, particularly people of color, they have not had gang affiliations. Um, they are people like you, okay? Um, they're people like me. So don't get, I think, distracted into thinking that um, we have uh, such a major issue with crime as well, and that, mm, you know, police are justified in stopping people all the time. There are some real issues related to race in this country, as everyone knows, over the last few days, okay? So anybody who denies that is frankly ignorant. Um, you also need to get involved in, um, you know, uh, calling, your, calling on LAPD, calling on Chief Beck uh, when you see issues that disturb you. Don't be complacent because this is all affecting everyone. Think about all the youth. Um, think about the Louises, the poet laureates, the Richards who are in jails right now. We're missing out in society because they are there and they're not here with us. So, you know, a lot of times people think, oh, that's a black issue, that's a brown issue. No, it's a societal issue. So figure out how you can plug in, how you can make a difference in your way. And okay. also reflect on, do you have any biases yourself? And how can you change those? Yes, ma'am? Yes, mean optimistic or pessimistic? Optimistic. Okay. <laughs> Luis, 
You know, I, I run a beautiful, I help run a beautiful culture center in the San Fernando Valley called Thea Chucha's Culture Center and Bookstore. We serve 15,000 people a year. We provide all the arts. We provide open mics. We have the only outdoor literacy festival. Uh, two, uh, last month, we had 1,000 people come through Pacoima, one of the most violent, one of the most poorest communities in the county. Not one violent incident. Everybody came together. Everybody loved each other. We have no media and we have no money. We're struggling every day for the little bit of money we have. There's a, a billion dollars in the LAPD money. There's a good campaign that Youth Justice Coalition is doing in which they're asking for 1% of that to go to communities that work with youth. I have helped change from 40 years many youth from gangs, from drugs. I have changed a lot of people. I know others who have done it, but we can't get no support. I do it for no money. I don't get paid to do what I do. I get paid for when I speak and when I write. But that work, when I'm out in the neighborhoods, when people call me, I do it for nothing. We need support. We need people to give us support just like they're giving the police so that we build that part of it because the police are getting the money. The other thing I just want to point out is Salinas, California is a city most people don't know. Five people were killed there by police in the last year and a half. Unarmed, farm workers, Mexican and Salvadorian. I believe in Black Lives Matter. I, I did poetry reading for them, but Brown Lives Matter, they're being killed at extraordinary rates as well, and I want to make sure we don't forget that uh, there's people in our, our brown communities who are also going through a lot of the same problems. Luis, optimistic or pessimistic? When you, you know, think about I, it? I have seen changes. I'm with Sam. 40 years, I have seen amazing changes, even within the police. I believe God is room for more, and I'm going to fight for more. So I'm optimistic that we're going to try to make something beautiful happen in this city. Luis Rodriguez, thank you. <laughs> and Yasmin Muktasich, thank you as well. I don't think I thanked you personally. Yasmin Muktasich, thank you so much for joining us. Luis Rodriguez, thank you for joining us. Richard Cabral, I want to hear just a final thought from you, and then I think you have another okay. yeah. performance for us, do you not? Uh, yes, I do. So, but I uh, wanted to hear a final thought from you. Will you share a thought from you about what you think makes a difference and what would matter? I started a poetry lounge in the community that I came from mm -hmm. um, like two months ago, and never in history has um, arts been embraced in my neighborhood. And I mean, the changes that it did to um, the community, you know, it, um, it, it, it's just magical. Like, people really like, wow, I have a voice. Um, my voice matters. And I don't really know too much about law enforcement, but I know about art. I know about storytelling. And I believe that if we could um, implement these things of that sort in communities, I think it might be better because art is what changed my life. So, I mean, that's, that's my feel. That's what I think. Thank you. Richard Carral. And you have, also from your one-man show, I believe, yes? Another excerpt from your one-man show? Yes. Richard Cabral, thank you. Don't you? Yeah, don't, yeah. Please. <laughs> we beg of you. Yeah. Great. I've 
out of me for two years and you're going to take me up to this because my best friend is helping me move? I have a little girl. There's no talking to them. They take me off to the county jail for 30 long days and nights. When I get out of jail, I go right to homeboy. I'm worried. I've lost my job. Worried. I've lost Father Greg's respect. He gave me a chance when nobody cares to look my way. When nobody cares if I live or die in the gutter. But you see, Father Greg gave me a new lease on life. I rush into his office, and a torrent of words rushes out. I tell him what happened. I tell him I need my job back. And I tell him I'm starving. And he gets up. Folds me in his arms and tells me, I believe in you, Richard. A book should not be judged by its first chapter. Some people just can't see beyond the first chapter. Don't worry about them. Worry about you and your family. Write the next chapter of your life. You can do it. Sorry. Sorry. I need a minute. Richard Cabral. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> we all need a minute, don't we? <laughs> Frank, can you give us a final thought? Our conversation has been going on in this theater, and thank you all so much for sharing your thoughts. Uh, with us and your honesty with us and your authenticity with us, all of you. Final thoughts, Frank, from what you really you've want me here? to follow that. I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> the, the balding white police reporter uh, <laughs> wrapping things up. <laughs> I have to take it back. So. 1,400 tweets, uh, okay. again, from across the country, right. people engaged in this conversation, very spirited debate. Uh, but I'll, I'll throw in a couple from Los Angeles. Sure. Uh, Micaiah Green, who's a policing activist in Los Angeles, says, 
uh, to police if they care. Why don't I ever see them in my neighborhood to serve instead of harass and ticket and arrest? And one from an LAPD officer, uh, Dion Joseph again, um, violence is, is more pervasive, so we are more cautious because of the violence, not because of the race, not because of the people we serve. So just an example of the continuing divide in the debate and sometimes folks sort of talking past each other than, than to did, each what, other. What did you take away from this conversation, Frank? Did you hear anything that you, different or something that struck you? Uh, from this conversation, yeah. uh, I mean, we're brought here together because there are unarmed people getting killed by police that I think increasingly people are saying, why? That these folks should still be alive or not in, in critical condition at a hospital in LA. Um, my take on overall the subject, uh, you know, that, that there continues to be a code of silence within law enforcement, that there are some bad cops out there that are not getting told on who should be told on. And we saw a case just like, I was in federal court earlier today where, where, where three sheriff's deputies were convicted and only because two others okay. testified against them. And then the second thing is just, again, the, the fearful cops. You know, when, when they're, they're fearful and it's not warranted, when someone is not armed. And how do you reduce that fear, change the training, maybe change recruitment? I don't know. Thank you. Well, thank you, Frank Stoltz. For, uh, for joining us. Thank you to all of you here in our live audience. Thanks to those following online. We'd really like to hear your thoughts. There's a survey that was given to you here. It's also available on the web, and uh, we'd love for you to share your thoughts about the conversation this evening. And now, we would like to end with a band that's dedicated to social activism and building community relationships, as we've been talking about here, through their music. Born in East LA, please welcome Quetzal. Thank you. I, I just we have some lyrics going around. Uh, yeah, well, we, while you're we, passing those around, I just want to say really quick, Michelle, if I may, that uh, from the inception of this country, uh, the process of colonization and, and, and slavery and, and all these things, there has never been a moment where brown and, and black bodies have been humanized, have been humanized, and the humanization of black and brown bodies is an integral process that the American people have gone through. And because of this, we have what uh, Bell Hooks calls white supremacist uh, uh, capitalist patriarchy. And this, to me, is the root of, of policing. Okay. All right. People asking why, 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 mothers crying, cry, 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 cry. Authorities building lies, lies, lies. It's a critical time. Books and faces, faces and books, where the truth weathers through. Moving picture, recording deaths that spar. Million man march. It is no coincidence. Collective skin tone of the innocent sparks in all of us the discontent. Initiating those who were once red and sent. Sparks in all of us the discontent. Initiating those who were once red and sent. People asking why, 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 why? Mothers crying, cry, 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 cry. Authorities building lies, lies, lies. It's a critical time. Moment in time, times of the moment. Rights patrolmen, people and showmen. Chanting soon dissipates, simple traders instigate. People disperse, as suffering media soon mitigates. Talks in all of us are discontent, initiating those who are once red and sin. How do you harness the energy of the march? How do you instill the momentum given the dark? 
be on the picket, the boycott and the trend that will soon be abated. Then all of these deaths are interrelated. Ferguson, Emmett, Guerrero, and Brown. How do we initiate our people to the eternal get down? So our people won't keep asking why. Mothers won't keep crying, cry, 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 cry. Forties building lies. It's a critical time. It's a critical time. You've been listening to our conversation on policing and community. This has been a collaboration between NPR and member station KPCC in Los Angeles. I'm Michelle Martin of NPR News. Thanks to my guests for joining us today here at the LA Theater Center. Richard Cabral, Luis Rodriguez, Yasmin Muktasid, Rafer Owens, Ruby Malachi, and Sam Quinones. And to all of us who joined us on the live stream and on Twitter using the hashtag streets and beats, we thank you. We hope this conversation will continue. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you. Do you have one more? Ketel, do you have one more for us? Do you want to introduce the band before you do? Like, stay, we want to hear this. We want to hear this. Do you want to introduce the band before you do? You have one more for us, right? <laughs> well, we want to know them. We were good. We were just running right in here. OK, <laughs> we have uh, Tailana Inomoto on violin. Yeah. Marta Gonzalez on harana and vocals. Evan Greer on drums. Juan Perez on bass. Okay. Alberto Lopez on keyboards and percussion. Okay. And I'm Quetzal Flores. Oh, uh, Quetzal Flores, thank you so much. After, the, after you do this encore, and thank you so much for doing this, we were hoping that all of you will join us for a reception in the foyer, how do you say it, the foyer, foyer. or the foyer, <laughs> that place out there. We hope you'll all stay. You're all invited. That's why we had to end the live stream, because we didn't want people to be jealous. So <laughs> just saying. That's why we had to end it right there. Gets all, thank you. Thank you. se lo llevaron, de noche se lo llevaron 43 estudiantes, policías municipales al narco los entregaron, al narco los entregaron policías municipales, ay no más, no más ay no más, no más No, 
muerto es mexicano, represivo y criminal. Que hay sin apaguas blancas, sin olvidarnos de actual. Son agenitos de Estado y de lesa humanidad. Y de lesa humanidad. Ay, no más, no más. Ay, no más, no más. A mí no me queda duda el terrorismo del Estado. De niveles de gobierno se estaban involucrados con sus narcos militares. El crimen organizado, masacre de Ayotzinapa, no eres un caso aislado. En Acapulco, copreros, cayeron asesinados, cayeron asesinados. Ay, no más, no más, ay, no más, no más. Nos han cerrado la lucha pacífico electoral. Solo nos queda un camino en resistencia popular. La autodefensa del pueblo, de la bota militar, de la bota militar. A lo más, no más, a lo más, no más. Sin sensato y responsable, llamarás a mi sonido. Si no tomamos las armas, se van a llenar los niños. Guerra sucia no ha parado del estado de guerrero. Los años 70 no encontramos compañeros, 43 estudiantes, son hijos del mundo entero con un dilinio de amor. Esperamos en Guerrero y esperamos en Guerrero. Ay, no más, no más, ay, no más, no más. Gracias, un saludo al don Félix García de la Letra. <risa> 